It's Friday, which means it's time for another exciting episode of Ask Us Anything. But before we get into today's questions, we thought we'd read you some of the comments on our earlier bonus episode on RDJ joining the MCU. Lots of you had lots of thoughts. At Travesty says, sounded like desperation from Disney, but at least Marvel has a chance to course correct after last year's downturn. Marvel still has quite a bit of baggage to clear, Captain 4, Agatha, Ironheart, Thunderbolts, before ushering the new era via Fantastic Four. At least there is a serious course correction which I appreciate, as I don't see that with Star Wars, sadly. That's Travesty's opinion on RDJ rejoining the MCU as Doctor Doom. Halisa Organa asks, is there any outcome where RDJ being Doom is actually good casting? What would the writers have to create for this to be justified casting? I don't have enough hope that they're going to take inspiration from the comics, to be honest. What do you think? At X-Ray and Drops says, RDJ heard someone claiming to be Marvel Jesus and took that personally. (laughs) At Rabbit Hop says, do you think RDJ came back to MCU for the fans or for the money? Well, the money's pretty good because this is getting ridiculous. Next thing we know, Josh Brolin as Thanos will be back to team up with the Avengers or something. And I think they had a great villain already with Kang, with the build-up and his character. Just recast lah. Ed Burn Like Cinders, I think, responds to your statement, Bahe, saying, I think they didn't try hard enough for the casting because there's a whole world of actors and you can't find anyone else for Doctor Doom. I know a lot have been cast in the MCU already, but there are still a lot that haven't. And I'm not talking about young actors because, of course, you need someone daddier to go up against the daddy of the next five years, Pedro Pascal. Don't know why, but Richard E. Grant and Russell Crowe popped into my head. I'm just spitballing because I admit I don't know Doctor Doom enough to know which actor has the best caliber to play that character. RDJ is great. I adore him as an actor. If he hadn't carried so much of the MCU weight over the last 10 years, maybe it would have been okay to cast him, i.e. William Hurt and Harrison Ford. But he has, and yes, RDJ doesn't equal Tony Stark, but he has been that face for 10 years. And he walked out there on Sunday with that stance, and I immediately was like, oh, it's Tony Stark. Just a quick one. Richard E. Grant has been in the MCU already, so there's that. In Loki. So has Russell Crowe, so there's that. I mean, I agree, but I think it can't just be any actor. It has to be someone who can stand up to Pedro Pascal. But also, sure, there are storytelling opportunities here, right? When the multiverse happens, let's be honest, the multiverse will happen. The fact that you would have potentially a Thor come through or even Kamala Khan come through and notice that Pedro Pascal is fighting against a Doctor Doom who looks eerily like their Tony Stark. I think that makes interesting storytelling. I still stand by it. I think I think there are very few actors of the caliber to pull off someone like Doctor Doom that hasn't been in the MCU. I can't think of anyone right now, to be honest. I think it's a bit of both, right? I think you have a very accomplished actor who can clearly do the job and you have the added bonus of him being a fan favorite. Sure, he was a fan favorite for Tony Stark, but I also think people respect Robert Downey Jr. and really love him within the MCU. I think I'm willing to give him a chance. I'm more than willing to give him a chance. And just to respond to Halisa Organa's point, I really don't care if they go down the route of the comics. Like, I don't want an infamous Iron Man where it's blending the Tony Stark and Victor Von Doom characters. I would rather they just treat Robert Downey Jr. like a Don Cheadle recast. Yeah. Like, just as an actor playing the part. You know, even Harrison Ford, sure, there is a sly joke about him not having a mustache and William Hurt having a mustache. But that's about it. I'm happy to move on from that. I wonder how people would react if James Gunn threw Robert Downey Jr. a lot of money and cast him in the DCU. What if Robert Downey Jr. had a significant anchor role in the DCU? How would fans react to that? Because, yet again, he is so associated with Tony Stark. I still say this casting excites me. Same. I hear everybody's comments. I I acknowledge everybody's feelings on this. I, however, am more than happy to look at this as an optimistic thing, right? Bringing back Robert Downey Jr., a fantastic actor, to the MCU in a different role. My only challenge would be for Robert Downey Jr. to not be Tony Stark in a Doctor Doom costume. Exactly. 
I think that's what I'm hoping happens. But also, the other reason I'm excited is I'm excited to see how they pull it off. Just from a writing, directing perspective, I'm curious to see what creative approaches they take to pull something like this off and make it work. From a storytelling challenge, right? I think this is very exciting. The last time I thought someone did something like this very well was with Star Trek, was with J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. I think the first Star Trek movie that Abrams did was absolutely fantastic in the way he rebooted the franchise, set it on a new path forward while using the same damn characters, only younger versions, but bringing in old Spock via time travel shenanigans. I thought it was very, very clever and very well done. And you have a Calvin timeline that you can follow that expands the universe as well, which is very cool. So I'm hoping something cool like that happens with the MCU moving forward. But it's also a different timeline. But it's going to merge, right? Because with Secret Wars, all of the timelines kind of merge. Sure. And I think, again, that's why I said earlier, I think that makes it exciting, right? To have that face on a villain means our current heroes will be put into a quandary, a crisis of confidence or whatever that will make it an interesting story all right let's get into this week's questions at kailash laxman asks here i was thinking i'd get a sneak peek at the war of the rohirrim at comic con but nothing what are your expectations of the movie do you think it'll be as good as spider verse that's high bar it is a very high bar i think that's unfair (laughs) but we are excited cautiously optimistic correct but also because we just want all the lord of the rings content we can get Yeah, but for me, my cautious optimism is only because I'm not a fan of the art style. Oh, you don't like the anime style? I really don't like the anime style. So for me, that's an automatic hit for me on the movie before I even watch it. I know it's on the schedule to be released in Malaysia in December, so we are getting it in cinemas. I haven't done very much research into it. I know they showed some footage at a animation convention a couple of months ago where Andy Serkis introduced it. But I haven't done much research into it. So I i, I mean, I know the story, but I don't know what they're doing with the film. And so I think cautious optimism is a good phrase. And I'm going to hold on to that. But I'm also cautiously optimistic that it performs. Mm. Because I think if it does well, then it boosts Warner's confidence in producing the other stuff that they've kind of promised to put out there. Because... Warner is a little skittish at the moment with finances and cancelling movies and TV shows and moving things from HBO to Max and vice versa and all of that stuff. So I really hope the movie performs well because I want to see more of the Lord of the Rings things. Completely agreed. At Iman Bahari asks, SDCC 2024 seemed to be a blast. What were your most anticipated announcements from the event? Mine were King Spawn, Marvel Rivals and DC All In. SDCC is always a blast. Just because if you've ever been, it's a lot of fun. There's so much stuff going on. And also just being around hundreds of thousands of geeks is always cool. I have to say this though, Iman Bahari, I know there's a script and a title, but I will believe that Kingspawn movie when I see it. McFarlane (laughs) has been talking about this for years. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm excited too, because I love love the Spawn comics, but I will believe it when I see it. Yeah. I mean, I was looking forward to what Feige was going to do at Hall H purely from a performance point of view because he's coming back to SDCC. He's got all of these fans to appease and I think he pulled it off. I think performance-wise, he did a very good job. Now he just needs to deliver on that promise, right? I was hoping that DC might do more, but I think they're really holding off because James Gunn just finished shooting... They did release the trailer for Creature Commandos, which I'm excited about. I like the DC Studios' new logo. I think it's just nostalgic and cool. And unlike the DCEU logo, it doesn't try to copy what Marvel Studios is doing. It's going in a different path, which is also cool. Yeah. And there were a bunch of comic announcements that I was excited about as well. They showed some clips from Batman Cape Crusader, which I really liked. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff at SDCC. I tend to just wait for things to trickle out later. I didn't have the time to sort of sit there and refresh my website. But also because, like you said, there's so many, so many things coming out that I have trouble keeping track of all things. For me, yeah, the Feige stuff, the Marvel stuff was exciting. I am cautiously excited for DC All In, although I have no idea what that's about right now. 
There were a bunch of Star Trek panels as well, wasn't there? There was a whole bunch of Star Trek stuff. And the trailer for Michelle Yeoh Section 31. And that. So that's pretty cool. Look, for me, I've been burned enough by SDCC announcements that don't come through that I'm always just waiting for an official press release later that the movie is in production or that the TV show has started shooting or something. I'm just going to wait. I, I try not to sort of get myself worked up too much about it. At my tipsy turvy asked, what is the one comic book story arc you wish Marvel or DC would do? And do you think it can be done? Now that they're doing Secret Wars, next in line would be Avengers vs. X-Men. For DC, identity crisis over another infinite crisis for me. Totally agree. Enough infinite crisis. We've got comics, la, we've got cartoons, la, we've got TV shows. I'm done. I mean, it is called infinite crisis. Yeah, but I don't There's need an infinite, infinite shows. Number numbers of crisis. Have you got one? I've got one. I know which one you got, lah. Don't you even shut pretend, up. La. You shut up. You go first. <sighs> okay, okay, okay. All right. So, both of mine are actually DC. Mm. Because Marvel has kind of covered a lot of my favorites. Right. I love the Infinity War story in Marvel. I grew up reading that stuff. I grew up reading Secret Wars. I have the original comics. It's very, very cool. Beyonder, Spider-Man getting his black costume, all of that stuff I absolutely loved. And I'm glad Marvel is doing it. DC hasn't done much of this. Mm. And so the ultimate one for me, which I know they will never make because I don't want a stupid cartoon. I want it live action. Okay. Kingdom Come. Oh, ballsy. It won't happen. It just won't ballsy. happen. Ballsy. Yeah, no. And... No. The other one that I think they can pull off, and this one I want in a TV show, maybe limited series, Green Lantern Far Sector. Oh, yeah. Far like a Sector crime a series. series with yeah. a lantern far away from Earth. I think that could be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But also I do want cartoon. Run. I want live action. Susa, that one's like... It's so cool though, with all the aliens and that world she's on. Yeah, that's the problem, right? It's it's a Green Lantern set on an alien planet just filled with aliens. That, yeah. That budget's just going to blow up. Spend some money, DC. Yeah. Mine would have to be Blackest Night. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know lah. <laughs> <laughs> also, that will Obviously. never happen. Obviously. Obviously. I feel like Blackest Night will never happen. There are too many backstory things that they would need to explain. Yeah, to fill in the blanks, right? But also just how all these superheroes were dead. You just can't. They just can't do it. Like, the other ones that I've been reading recently, DC's Deceased is really fun. Oh, if they go down the vampire slash zombie route. Oh, that one's great. That would be so good. Deceased is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I think with Deceased, you can... I think with Deceased, you can do only because it's a very self-contained story. All your favorite heroes are alive when the comic starts. Then they drop off like flies, but, but they're all there, right? So you don't have baggage to begin with. I think with... Marvel, I would like to see some... You see, the problem is Marvel has shrunk down some of their most famous runs into movies already. Like, the Captain America Return of Bucky Barnes as the Winter Soldier was a fantastic run on Marvel, but we've seen it already in a film. And so Marvel has covered a lot of their most iconic storylines. The only stuff that Marvel hasn't covered in a big way is all of their outer space intergalactic stuff, which we thought was going to kick off with the Eternals. But that seems to be on hold. As for Marvel, it's not really a story arc, but I really, really want a Howard the Duck movie or series. I think those comics are great. I think there's potential to do some zany fucking shit with it. And I really hope they do. Mm. With Batman alone, oh my god, Hush, you can do a fantastic series on. And I think there are all of these small Batman runs that mm. make for really, really cool stories. Sure, Nolan took a bit of Long Halloween and kind of fed it into his Dark Knight stuff, but I would like a straight up Long Halloween adaptation, which would be superb as well. So yeah, there's a lot of those runs that I'd like to see in live action, but yeah, I don't know, my tipsy turvy. It's a bit hard to pull off given the commitment required on the part of the actors playing those parts. Batman Year Zero, I think, from the New 52 with the Riddler shutting down Gotham and having that sort of weird game show thing. Batman Court of Owls was fantastic. I would also throw in something like the Daredevil stuff. But I want to see the crazy mystical Daredevil. 
not just Daredevil in... Not just alcoholic Daredevil lah. The current run has him dying and meeting the devil and then coming back as a white Daredevil. And it's just this whole weird thing which is really cool because I think... I think the movies and even the TV show have failed to really address the daredevil's inner turmoil between being a vigilante and his Catholicism. I think the TV show sort of skirt past it quite quickly. That Catholicism, I think his background with his religion really drives him as a character. So that kind of stuff I'd love to see. Yeah. At Tapa 12, true or false, Deadpool and Wolverine's box office performance it's testament that a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously can make big bucks if you have enough millennial references and give the internet what they want, like the Wolverine meme. I somewhat disagree. I think all of the memification of stuff and having Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds appear on every show, on every episode of Hot Ones and Gordon Ramsay and all of that stuff, I think that's a byproduct and a sideshow that helps market the movie. I somewhat agree with the idea that it shouldn't take itself too seriously. Now, I'm not one to ever put down comic books or superhero movies as anything other than art, because I believe they are. However, I think a lot of the commentary surrounding comic books and superhero movies tend to think that unless it's elevated, it's not good enough. And I have a problem with that, because I think... A comic book movie and a superhero movie can still be high art and lean into everything that makes it a comic book movie and a superhero movie. Heck, Deadpool Wolverine, make a joke about it right up top when Deadpool goes, oh look, he's wearing a superhero costume like he's not embarrassed to be in a superhero movie. And I think one of the great things about Deadpool and Wolverine, why we loved it so much, was because it wasn't embarrassed to be what it was. Also, yes, I know some of the thoughts have been divisive, but I think those people just clearly don't understand what's going on. I'll just say it. I think they've missed the bigger point and the meta commentary that this movie is trying to make, which also fed in beautifully to what was going on in SDCC on Sunday. I don't know if it was planned. I don't think it was planned, but it was such a phenomenal coincidence to kind of bolster the meta-ness of Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, I mean, I think not taking itself too seriously can come off as self-deprecating i think it was just that this movie was being fun and i think the statement of not taking itself too seriously was what a lot of people had problems with with taika waititi's thor movies it doesn't work both ways i feel like deadpool and wolverine worked out because the character demands it to be such despite what people said about the new Thor film, I loved that it didn't take itself too seriously. I don't think just by having millennial references, Deadpool and Wolverine makes the kind of money it makes. I think it works for the universe, right? If there was a new, I don't know, Captain America movie or whatever, and it suddenly had all millennial references and memes and what I, I don't think it would have worked either because that is not the tone of that character. So I feel for me, the biggest thing about Deadpool, all the Deadpool movies have been that Ryan Reynolds, the writers, the directors understood the character and what the audience wants from that character. And you know what's really funny is that She-Hulk is very much a similar character in the comic books. Yeah. But I think because of anti-wokeism and sexism, people didn't react to that in the exact same way. Because when you watch the She-Hulk TV series, and I urge you to go try and watch it again, sure, the CGI doesn't hold up, but the writing and the character depictions in the film are very, very true to what the character is in the comics, which is what you appreciate in Deadpool. But I think the problem with the She-Hulk thing is not enough people know the character. That's the problem. Yeah. But also, I think we may have jumped past Tapao's question and also answered Kaber's question, who said... What would your somewhat detailed review of Deadpool and Wolverine be like, especially since you gave it 11 out of 10? Curious to know your thoughts, since there are several divisive reactions to the movie. Yes, we've spoken about the divisive reactions, but Kabi, we also urge you to go check out our spoiler-free review on the Goggler podcast, where we talk about why we actually enjoyed the movie and why we think the movie was important to the MCU, especially at this point in the MCU. 
I've read some of the divisive reactions and a lot of them talk about how it's almost a corporate artifact. I don't think we should be able to disconnect this film from being a corporate artifact. That's what the MCU is. Disney, Marvel, that's what it's become. It's interwoven into all of our entertainment and our popular culture. And so it's making commentary on that as well. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually a very, very good thing. I find all complaints regarding Star Wars and Marvel, but like any comments or any knock against those two brands being Disney's fault, I feel that that's misguided. I feel like that's really just looking for a scapegoat, someone to blame. I think misguided is too nice a word. I think people are just being stupid. They've always been corporate products. Read the history of both of these things. They've always been corporate products and they've always fucked up along the way. Yeah. There's never been any point in the history of Marvel or Disney or Star Wars where the product has been perfect. Lucas has fucked up right royally throughout his endeavors with Star Wars. Even when he hasn't fucked up, he has then decided 20 years later to go back and fuck it up. Correct. So, So, you know, people be crazy. It's rooted in nostalgia, like misplaced nostalgia. Just because they see Disney as a Mickey Mouse brand, they think that Star Wars cannot live under the Mickey Mouse brand, which I disagree completely. For me, I don't care who owns it. For me, it's all about the creative forces that power it. Who are the writers you hire? Who are the directors? Who are the actors? That's what's important, right? But also... Who was the executive at the studio that fucked it up? Oh, that too. There is a very specific person that we can blame at Disney for the Marvel stuff being of a lower quality. And it was the previous head of Disney who wanted a billion shows a year coming out on streaming and cinema and everything. I think that was the problem. And you had quantity over quality. Yes, exactly. I think that is the problem. It's not the fact that it's owned by Disney. It's individual decision. At Daphne M88 says, two major superhero animation series are back this season. X-Men 97 and now Batman Cape Crusader. Between the two, which did you like better? I know Batman isn't a direct sequel, but I grouped them together because they were the marvelous hour of Saturday afternoon prime time cartoons. Do you have a preference? I think I do. Oh, Batman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. X-Men 97 is absolutely fantastic and I love it a lot but for me x-men 97 caters to x-men fans which i am one of but batman cape crusader doesn't just cater to batman fans i think it caters to fans of old hollywood fans of noah mysteries fans of supernatural stories there is so much going on in batman cape crusader And for me, it is just this totally well-rounded piece of animation. I love it. I agree with you. I think Batman Cape Crusader is a very well-rounded piece of animation. But I also feel like the storytelling is very mature storytelling. And I don't mean mature as in blood and gore, but I mean mature storytelling as in this isn't just an excuse to show more Batman this time in animation form. In fact, for the most part, Batman isn't really a main character in this, despite the show being called Batman Cape Crusader, right? There's a lot of, from the point of view of Bullock, there's a lot of stories that are told from the point of view of Commissioner Gordon, from Barbara Gordon. It is really just a story set in Gotham and all the characters that are coming in and out of it, as opposed to it being Batman from start to finish of all the episodes. And I feel like that's really exciting and really interesting and a really good way to approach it because if you read the comics, Gotham City is a character in those comics. And this show really sort of doubles down on Gotham City as a character. It's really rich. La. Yeah, you said it in one word what I what I said in 27. No, but so, the world building no, right. is so rich, right? And it's yeah. just beautiful to look at. It's already dropped on Prime Video. It dropped yesterday. So I'm really excited for people to watch this. And I think, yeah, I think they're going to love it. It's so good. All right, that brings us to the end of another exciting episode of Ask Us Anything. Keep your questions coming in. 
You know what to do. You can reach out on all of our social media feeds, Goggler MY. You can also email us on podcast at goggler.my or send us a WhatsApp at the Goggler hotline, 012-524-5208. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Goggler Podcast.